this time, I'd like to introduce my four honored guests. Um, with us, we have Andrew Lau, Associate Director for Fine Arts Admissions, Webster University. Daniel Willett, Assistant Director of Admissions, Savannah College of Art and Design. Ju Juliet Olson, Undergraduate Admission Counselor, Chapman University. And Brandon Wente, Associate Director of Admissions, Concordia College. On behalf of Navigate 2020 event sponsor, go to College Fairs. I'd like to extend a warm welcome to all of our panelists. And thank you so much again for taking the time to talk about this topic. And uh, whenever you're ready, you may begin. So I pass it along to you all. Okay, so welcome. We're gonna go ahead and share our screen here. So hopefully you can, you can see that, Understanding Admissions at Fine and Performing Arts Colleges. Good, we can all see it. I'm getting a nod from, uh, from my panelists. So um, just gonna go over a little bit kind of what we're gonna do. We have, we're gonna have some welcome and introductions. We're gonna uh, also talk about, um, we're each gonna spend a little bit of time talking about our own institutions because all four of our schools represented here are, are fairly different and you are, you're gonna be able to learn quite a bit from the differences in the school. So we wanna spend a little bit of time going over what each of our fine arts uh, programs are, are like. Then we're gonna move into kind of a panel discussion for, the, um, for some important things that kind of fine arts students you know, need to know. We're gonna talk about the admission and portfolio review process, kind of give you some tips and some pointers uh, on that. We wanna go over a little bit about how you kind of uh, search for colleges. We wanna talk about um, finding the right program, different schools call different programs and majors, different things in the arts. So we wanna talk a little bit about that. Uh, also probably, perhaps most importantly, we're gonna give you some tips as to kind of, you know, is this the right career for, for me? Should I be going into this? So we're gonna do that. And then of course, we're gonna take, we'll take some Q and A. So um, these are the folks that are gonna be presenting. So uh, we all kind of uh, said hi to you uh, a little bit ago. I'll put this slide up at the very end. That way you'll have all of our contact information. So you know, you know how to get a hold of us uh, directly, but these are your these are your four presenters. So, and just like they're listed here, and we're going to start off, like I said, with giving you an overview of each of our schools. And so, what we're going to do is we're gonna, just like it has on your screen, we're going to move from east to west here uh, in terms of uh, uh, giving you information. So, we're going to start out with Dan uh, over at SCAD. Thank you, Andrew. I appreciate it. I want to thank you guys for joining us today. I'm really excited to have you all here and uh, talk to you a little about our schools in the process. Just to give you a quick overview, this is kind of a SCAD 101, a real easy introduction to the school. You can see here, um, we have multiple campuses. We have a campus in Atlanta and Savannah, Georgia, one in Lacoste, France, which is the south of France, and one on the e-learning platform. Fortunately, that Hong Kong campus just shut down this year. We're not gonna continue that, but the, the other three are open to any students that wanna join. Uh, your tuition and scholarship will follow you wherever you go in those, in those campuses. So if you want to switch campuses, feel free to do that wherever you feel inspired. Our student body is about 15,000 students now between all of our campuses. Uh, we also represent all 50 states and some territories, including Puerto Rico and Guam. Uh, and then we represent 100 different countries for our international student body. So we have about a 25 to 30 percent international student population, a really diverse student body. You can see through our degrees here, we offer everything from a bachelor's to a master's of urban design. There's a lot of different degrees you can get and over a hundred different programs of study. So we have 40, more than 40 majors and more than 75 minors or certificates that you can get. So you really, really can customize your learning and whatever you want to do. What are you passionate about? We want you to pursue that. Um, you can also see in the top right corner of that, that is our alumni employment rate for the last two years. We're super proud about that. That means that our students are not only becoming great artists, that they're able to get out of the industry, out of the school and into the industry and the field that they like and that they wanna pursue and to find success in that. And we also have tons of clubs on school, uh, school clubs that you can join, um, SCAD pros there. And then just below that 99%, you can see we have some uh, NAIA championships. SCAD also has athletics. So if you're an artist, but you're an athlete as well, and you wanna to continue to compete, you can definitely do that at SCAD. Um, and two unique, we have a lot of unique sports, but two of the ones that are most unique are our esports teams. We have an Overwatch team and a League of Legends team. 
which are intercollegiate and they can award scholarships too if you're good at it. So if you're interested in uh, sports or art and design, if you're passionate, that's really what we're looking for at SCAD. Andrew, would you skip to the next um, slide for me, please? Thank you, sir. This is just a list of 45 of our top majors. These are the ones that most students are pursuing in school. And you can see there's a lot of variety at SCAD. So we'll start with our visual arts. If you're a photographer, a sculptor, a painter, you're into ceramics, you want to do graphic design, we love to have those students in our programs. We, we help them to get their art into the communities. You can sell your art if you're a prolific student. We have open studio nights. Um, so that's a really great program for visual artists. Moving on to computer-aided design with our uh, graphics programs, motion media, interactive game design, uh, augmented reality, virtual reality programs. We have an amazing fashion program, accessory design. Uh, moving into fashion, you can do uh, fashion accessories, you can do fashion design, you can do the business of beauty and fragrance, which is a mix between fashion and marketing. So there's a lot of different options for you guys. And some really unique ones too, like user experience or equestrian studies. If you have anybody riding horseback out there and you wanna pursue that through college, you can do that at SCAD. Um, and one thing I definitely wanna point out to you guys, if you are interested, I have, uh, I wanna get some of these catalogs into your guys' hands. I have a lot of SCAD catalogs that include everything involved in school. So if you wanna get one of these into your hands, I have a QR code here that you can scan sometime throughout um, and I'll make sure to personally send you a catalog. And then uh, just for you guys, since you're here today and we appreciate you joining us, I've actually uh, created a QR, uh, sorry, a fee waiver code for you. So within the next two weeks, if you decide to apply, you can put in GTCF 2020 and that'll waive your uh, application waiver. Uh, I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions and I'm happy to answer towards the end, but I'll move on to Andrew. Thanks, Andrew. Great, thanks, Dan. So moving from Georgia to Missouri now, you guys probably didn't think you'd get a geography lesson in this as well too, but that's what we're gonna end up with. So uh, I'm the Associate Director for Fine Arts Admissions at Webster University. Webster is a located in, uh, actually Webster Groves, Missouri, which is a suburb of St. Louis. Um, we're a liberal arts school, so we what that means is we do a little bit of everything. So we have a wide variety of majors, but two of our more prominent programs are in the fine arts majors and communications. So within our school of fine arts, within our school of communications, we have everything from acting to animation, art, dance, film and television, music, musical theater, tech theater. There's also some up there I, I didn't uh, put on there, but we have uh, we, we have a music production program, a sound engineering program. We have video game design, so we do a lot in those a uh, lot in those areas there. The total enrollment for Webster um, is about 3,500 uh, undergraduate students, and of those undergraduates, you have about a thousand in the fine arts and communications uh, arts areas. So those are two pretty popular programs for us in terms of uh, reflecting our our student enrollment. So. For our application procedure, it is, um, it is a little unique in that, um, so there's a two-step process if you go into any of the fine arts areas. So specifically, art, dance, music, and theater, you get admitted academically, just like any student would, but then you would do a audition or portfolio review for specific acceptance into a specific arts area. So. So some, I'll have students that, that tell me that their, their grades are, are really good and they did really, they're valedictorian and, and maybe they did really well in their ACT or SAT and that's great. They're admitted academically, no problem there. But then they would have to do an audition for specific acceptance into the theater program, into the music program, or in the case of art or tech theater, um, it would be a portfolio review. So um, now the thing that's a little confusing is in the School of Communication, where we have film and animation and game design and music production, those do not require a portfolio review. Those are those are declared uh, majors, but I did want to put those up there since we do offer both of those. And these are the acceptance rate. We do get that question quite a bit in terms of what is the acceptance rate into these indiv individual programs there. And so I did want to include that so you can kind of just see um, how that looks right there. Now, in terms of what we're looking for in, in applicants, again, because this question comes up quite a bit, how to prepare for the audition, what do I include in my portfolio, what shouldn't I include in my portfolio, so I do want to give you a little bit of an idea of what we're looking for. First and foremost, we're looking for talent, and um, that's kind of a funny thing, it's kind of hard, you know, hard to get your arms around exactly what that is and quantify that, 
Um, the one thing I could tell you is, you know, our faculty know it when they see it, they know when they you know it when they hear it, they know it when they experience it. You know, during your portfolio review or audition, we are not sitting there with, you know, a a series of check boxes and saying, okay, if a student does this, this, and this, they're admitted. It's not that black and white of a, a process. But for us, it's pretty easy to tell when a student, um, you know, has that talent and just kind of has that natural ability. Natural ability and talents, one thing, we want you to have a willingness to take direction. Somebody could have all the talent in the world, but if they're not open to direction, if they're not open to constructive criticism, um, that's going to be really hard for us to work with. So you need to have that as well, too. You need to have an engagement with the material and its, and its source. And what I mean by that is whatever material you are bringing to the audition, we want to know that you're fully engaged uh, with that, whether it's, a, whether it's a script, whether it's a piece of music, whether it's a monologue, um, you know, anything, even our art majors. Our art majors, we expect you to talk about your work significantly. Why did you do it? Why is it important to you? Why did you choose to express yourself using art instead of another uh, medium? So all of that is very important there. We do need passion, okay? We need to get the impression from you that your life will be incomplete unless you could be on stage. We need to get the impression that your life would be incomplete unless you could dance every day or, or um, you know, draw or paint or something like that. So that passion definitely has to come through. You need a basic knowledge about Webster University. Um, one thing that's kind of some students do that kind of is a negative is sometimes we'll ask them during the process, what do you know about Webster? How did you hear about Webster? Why are you interested in Webster? And if they can't answer that question, that worries us a little bit that, you know, because we want that reciprocal interest. They really need to be interested in, in what they're doing. And then a naturally curious personality. We absolutely need that because let's face it, that's what art is, right? That's what the arts is. It's about the world around you. It's about your reaction to the world around you. It's about how you fit into the world around you. So all of that is really, really important um, as we go as we go through. We need you to be naturally curious um, about a lot of things. So that's really uh, a critical. All these elements are things that we take in, into consideration. So with that, I'm gonna pass it on to Brandon and he's gonna visit with you a little bit about Concordia. Thank you very much. So again, my name is Brandon Wente and I'm an Associate Director of Admission at Concordia College. Um, Concordia is located in Moorhead, Minnesota, so kind of the upper Midwest areas next to Fargo, North Dakota, if you're familiar with those areas. Um, and we're a liberal arts college, so I would say that we have the majority of our students are going to be studying things in, um, you know, sciences, business, um, a variety of different areas. And we also have a very strong commitment to being able to allow students to participate in the arts, like at a co-curricular level. Um, so about 2,100 students on campus total, small class sizes, that kind of stuff, um, 120 plus areas of study. And I think that it's relatively common that our students are double majors uh, on our campus. So um, for students who maybe want to do something like, you know, a theater major, but then pair that with psychology um, or to do a music major. Um, and then pair that maybe with something else. I know a couple of my friends were music and math double majors, which was an interesting combo. Um, so a lot of ways that students can start to uh, visualize maybe how they want to structure the academics, but then keep music or arts or theater kind of however they want to structure that. Um, we also have this PEAK program on our campus. It's an acronym that stands for Pivotal Experiences in Applied Knowledge. And this is a, a program that requires students to do work outside of the classroom and outside of what they've been studying or doing to apply uh, kind of all the skills that they've been learning to a real world setting. A um, couple examples of those would be like, you know, maybe theater students doing something in community theater or music students being involved with like a different ensemble uh, kind of throughout but it allows you to have kind of built up a resume or a portfolio or something that you can take after your undergraduate experience um, to really kind of showcase that kind of stuff. Um, if you would like to please proceed to the next slide. So we do have one degree program that is uh, separate from our Bachelor of Arts, sort of that liberal arts perspective, and that's our Bachelor of Music program. Um, it, those are going to be in areas of like vocal or instrumental performance, composition, education, um, and it, like I don't know, the quickest way to talk about it would just be that your, um, 
liberal arts classes that you would typically take are then just replaced with more music courses. So if you are someone who is interested in a lot of like more music heavy things, that could be uh, the right route for you. Um, but then I'm also the liaison for our theater and visual arts scholarships. And we have a number of students who are involved with different scholarship programs on campus without having to be full majors within those programs. Um, so those different scholarship areas are going to range, you know, different scholarship dollars and all that kind of fun stuff. Um, it might have some different requirements that we'll talk about a little bit later. But in terms of like how our students are engaged with the campus, about 700 students, so again, about 2,100 students total, and about 700 of them involved with music. So that's about a third of our campus, um, meaning that, you know, there's tons of flexibility that like this academic like school day ends, and then you can start doing some of the co-curriculars like music and theater and all these other types of things. So if you have additional questions, you'll have my contact information as, uh, at the end as well. Excellent. All right, let's head out to California and Juliet, where it's just about lunchtime. So uh, go for it, Juliet. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Um, as you know, my name is Juliet Olson. I am an admission counselor from Chapman University. Um, if you're not familiar, Chapman University is a medium-sized private liberal arts institution located in Southern California. We have around 200 different areas of study that span over a very large spectrum. The spectrum ranges from performing arts, film, STEM, pre-med, business, humanities, and everything in between. Um, with that, we offer a variety of different degrees, including BAs, BSs, BFAs, and BMs. Um, for the sake of this presentation, I'm going to focus primarily on our performing arts programs. Um, however, the educational platform at Chapman um, provides a really unique setup because our students are able to experience the robust conservatory style performing arts degree, but they can also have that all encompassing experience in a large and dynamic um, community and college environment. Uh, but moving forward, our areas of study specific to our college of performing arts includes dance, screen acting, theater, and music. Um, I want to quickly mention that we also have a renowned film school um, in fact, our Dodge College of Film and Media Arts is ranked within the top five in the entire nation. Um, and it houses a wide variety of programs like film production, creative producing, animation and visual effects, film studies, and more. So if anyone has questions about our film school, I'm happy to tackle those after our presentation. Um, but back to our College of Performing Arts, the largest programs in this department are dance and theater. Both of these programs have a BA and BFA option. In our theater program, students have to decide if they want to apply for the BA or the BF program off the bat. However, with our dance program, all of our students start in the BA degree, and then once they're on campus and they have that exposure to the program, um, they can determine if they want to stay in the BA or the BFA route. Um, we also offer minors in dance and minors in musical theater. Um, some more context about Chapman University. In total, we have just over 7,600 um, undergraduate students. Our College of Performing Arts specifically houses just over 500 students. Um, all of the students who apply to Chapman University must apply via the Common Application. Every single talent program at our institution will have an additional layer of the application called the Creative Supplement. This Creative Supplement is essentially the portion of your application where you're able to demonstrate your talent ability in relation to the program you're applying for. Um, this creative supplement looks different from program to program. However, every single student applying to, the, to, with, applying to a talent program within the College of Performing Arts will have some type of pre-screen audition within their creative supplement. Um, and finally, our acceptance rate varies from programs to program, as you can see. And keep in mind that these statistics change from year to year as well as our applicant pool changes. Um, but you can see that our dance program has about a 33% acceptance rate, theater 23%, screen acting 10%, and music 60%. I mentioned our film school a couple minutes ago, and just for added context in that sense, our film production program has about a 6 to 8% acceptance rate there as well. Thank you very much. Um, and then moving forward, at Chapman University, admission is contingent on a student's acceptance to both our general institution and our talent program. 
Um, I'll go ahead and explain our evaluation process in further detail a little bit later in this presentation, but um, from the performing arts side, we're essentially looking for talent abilities for the specific program that the student's applying for. Um, we like to see dynamic students who have high levels of technique and performance quality, um, high levels of artistry and, and both passion and discipline for their area of interest as well. Um, and with that, we can go ahead and transition into um, the bulk of our presentation. Yes, we're going to move forward with some just general information and really I, I guess I should probably say specific information for the fine arts student. And remember, if you have questions as they come up, please use that Q&A feature and towards the end we will we will try and answer as many of those as possible. We, but we do want to move on to some information that's going to be apl uh, applicable to all art students. First of all, um, as you're doing your research, there are several things that you can look for. One of the things is some colleges are going to have more of a, for some arts colleges are going to have more of a liberal arts program emphasis, and some are going to have more of a, a professional degree program emphasis. This chart should give you kind of a nice idea of kind of what, you know, what to expect. And what I will tell you is, and I'm sure what all, all my colleagues on this call would tell you, there is not a right or wrong program here. There's not a right or wrong answer. It really depends on what you are looking for in, in a program. Um, you know, they, you know, it's funny, Brandon mentioned about the student that he had that he knew that double majored in math and music. You know, a program like Concordia would be perfect for that. However, if you're one of those students that after high school, you never want to see another math class as long as you live, you may want to look at a professional degree program, which probably is going to allow you to kind of tiptoe around that. So because with a professional degree program, you can see here, at least two thirds, preferably three quarters will be within your, within your major. In fact, taking that a step further, um, if you're interested in visual arts, there's some art programs that are called art institutes. And they're really, a lot of those, it's just four years of art and you really don't have to take those other supplemental programs or other supplemental classes. So it depends on what you're looking for, but th these are kind of a good idea. Um, we're gonna talk about double majoring. Some schools encourage it, some schools don't, but um, double majoring is often encouraged at a liberal arts school at a professional degree program, it may not be. The second to last bullet point too is really interesting as well too. At some professional degree programs, the only way to be in, a, be in the program is, is to be part of that program. Our Conservatory of Theater of Arts is that way. Uh, we have a wonderful theater program at Webster, but the only, you, you can't just do it on the side or as an extracurricular activity. The only way to be involved you know, in the Conservatory of Theater Arts is to be actually in that major. Whereas if you're at a different type of setting, the productions may be open to a variety of, of students or really kind of the, you know, kind of the student body. So I would say spend some time looking at this slide, uh, replay it later if you need to, and try and figure out kind of what category you're, you're going to fall into because different schools have different approaches, not right or wrong. It's all about fit and what, what works best for you. Well, and I think maybe to quick add to that, um, yeah. there could be some opportunities, like I know at Concordia, if a student started as a Bachelor of Arts, they could apply for the Bachelor of Music program up until their sophomore year. Um, so it could be something that you could, you know, do some research and see if there's possibilities of doing auditions uh, beyond like that incoming student experience. Yeah, most places are going to allow for some flexibility after, after you're there, as long as you don't wait, uh, wait too long to do that. Um, one thing that you'll find differently too is that schools do evaluate their uh, candidates differently. And we touched on this a, a little bit, but um, this would be an example of that first one, one decision made by the Office of Admission only with no audition or portfolio review required. Dan, I believe mentioned that's, that's how SCAD does it. The second bullet point, this is how Webster does it in terms of um, after the academic accept, like they won't even get to the artistic decision until we have an academic accept. And then um, others, there's a collaborative decision by the admissions and the, the artistic department there. So uh, anybody from the panel want to comment further on that or something you want to want to add to that? Yeah, I can just comment real quickly about the top one. Um, that's exactly how ours works. You apply, you get an admissions committee that makes a decision based on your first Savannah College of Art and Design based specifically on your test scores and your GPA and that's really all you need to get into school. You don't, you're not required to turn in a portfolio. Uh, portfolios are there to help you get more scholarship or get awarded some extra um, financial aid, but we don't require them. Excellent. Um, I'm going to share a little bit more on, on Chapman's evaluation process too. We fall under that collaborative decision-making um, style 
So when you apply to Chapman, I mentioned in my slide that you submit your application via the common application. Um, and that gets sent directly to the Office of Admission and the Admission Committee evaluates that student for the general institution. Whereas that creative supplement I mentioned that contains your pre-screen audition, among other materials, gets sent directly to the department or the talent department that you're applying for. And their faculty and departmental committee will evaluate you from a talent basis. And then your admission decision is contingent on a collaborative and ultimate decision made simultaneously from both committees. So as you can see, uh, different schools are gonna approach this different ways. Probably the most important thing on this slide is the, is the last thing here at the bottom. It can be kind of hard to decipher exactly what colleges are doing and how. Believe me when I tell you, the single most important or the best thing that you can do, email the school, call the school, and just ask them, how does your process work? Because it is gonna be different from different schools. And even sometimes it can be different within a school. Like you could have a university and the music department does it differently from the theater department who does it differently from the dance department. So again, it's a little bit overwhelming, but seriously, the job of the Office of Admissions is to help you kind of through this process. So do not be afraid to kind of inquire and figure out kind of what you're dealing with. I, you know, I would go as far if you want to as to make a spreadsheet even. You know, here are my eight schools and here are the requirements for those eight schools and how they handle it. Um, you can find that can be very helpful because it's hard to kind of, to kind of keep all that straight there. Um, Dan, you want to talk a little bit about auditions and portfolio reviews and kind of what students um, should expect in that process? Yes, absolutely. So portfolios, you know, are uh, like for our school not required, but they're definitely a vital thing to have as an artist to be able to build your body of work, to learn to take some criticism and to show people and that, you know, it is, it does make you feel vulnerable to share your work, but it's an important thing to do. So building that portfolio early on is, is important and being able to have I would say having way more material than you need is a lot easier to get rid of artworks than it is to have to complete two works in two weeks and feel stressed about it. So one suggestion just for everyone is no matter what you're doing, keep it, don't give it away, just keep everything you have because when it comes to building that portfolio, being able to get rid of work is a lot easier. So keep everything you have. Then just talking about things we look for, um, a really easy way to say it is three points. The things that I look for are your presentation, your technical skill, and then the brand or the theme of this portfolio. So with the presentation, it sounds really simple to present clearly, but just make sure, you know, I can't tell you how often I see people that have cropped images that are just a little bit off or a shadow of your phone over it. So just be very cognizant of how you're presenting this as if you were going to put this on a wall for an art show to sell to someone. That's how we want to see it presented clearly and um, sharp. The second thing is your technical skill. We want to be able to gauge where you are in the technical skill. Um, what your art level is as an artist or uh, what skills you possess or varieties you have. So if you have something that is your brand, I'm not sure about all the portfolios here with all schools, but for us, we don't require certain things. You don't need a hundred hand drawings or realia. It's just 10, you know, a certain amount of things that are you as an artist and help you shine as an artist. So what is it that makes you shine? What are the things that you love to do that you're passionate about? Show us those things and show us the best of your things. And if you have a variety of skills, whether it's uh, creative suite programs and illustration and ceramics, definitely show a variety as well. Just make sure that it makes sense. So that's the third part. Does it make sense what I'm looking through? If this is my first time reading your portfolio and I'm flipping through it, is it easy to tell why you chose these pieces, why you chose the order of these pieces? You know, is it, or is it, uh, this is from eighth grade, this is from seventh grade, this is my 11th grade stuff and it's just pulled in. Or did you think about it and say, these are my character sketches, these are the first iteration, these are the final pieces? That would make a lot of sense to do that. So the more people you can get to review that and just kind of look at your portfolio, the better you're gonna get in your feedback. So those are the three things that I would say, you know, obviously there's a lot more we look at, but presentation, technical skill, and then the theme or the brand of this portfolio that you're presenting. Great, Thank, thanks, Dan. So you can see this slide here for do's and don'ts. Brandon was telling me earlier that he's uh, sat in on, on, on auditions and portfolios re reviews. So he's seen the good and the bad. And so he's just gonna, gonna walk through a few of these and give you some perspective on that. Right, so I'm not obviously gonna read through all of these or anything like that. I may highlight a couple of things that have already been said and then maybe a couple of examples. But um, I think that number one thing at the top of the do's list of like finding the instructions and guidelines and following them. 
um, is very important. Uh, so being able to say like if it only is asking for a minute of uh, like a, a music recording or a theater audition or something like taped, um, make sure that you're kind of staying within the guidelines uh, and trusting that the people on the other end for that scholarship review are the professionals that, you know, they hear and see auditions all the time. Um, so they can really kind of pick out like what are those qualities that you have that are going to make you a strong candidate for the program um, and, and things like that along the way. Um, so if it's asking for like one minute, don't send in three because again, there's a lot of, you know, uh, pieces that are coming in at once and they can't, they don't have time to review just you know, how, whatever you choose to, to send in that might vary from, from the, uh, the different pieces. Um, and that's happened plenty of times on my end when I'm looking at theater uh, scholarship applications that come in, visual art scholarships, um, that students are just saying, here's my entire portfolio of work when we might have only asked for 10 pieces and we want them to really sort of be their own editor and pick what they feel are their best works or their best pieces. Um, at the uh, top end of the don't section, I also want to highlight about um, really kind of looking at pieces that are catered to showcasing all of your strengths. I think I tend to see a lot of students who try to uh, come up with like a, a new piece to add to their repertoire that they think is going to be like super challenging that they that they think the professors want to see um, on the review end and there can be a challenge to that because if you're not ready to tackle that type of work it's it might come out maybe not as clean and as sharp as you want it to, to be. Um, so focusing on, you know, what is in your repertoire, what are things that you can pull from that you can maybe elevate to the next level um, instead of trying to like relearn something or reinvent the wheel. Um, really kind of be focusing on, on what's sort of already in your back pocket. Um, and then going uh, based on what Daniel had said about like presentation, what, are, what is it that these, uh, the committee people are seeing? Um, I think the weirdest example would be, you know, we had a student who submitted a, uh, a recording for piano. Um, we had asked for an audio, audio recording. They had sent in a video recording, um, which again, kind of already going against those rules, uh, but they were wearing like flannel SpongeBob pajamas. And I was like, now, could you have tilted the camera up so we didn't see that? Could you have just sent in an audio recording, you know, and so that student did not get selected as a finalist for the scholarship and um, based on just a variety of different things. So really kind of be thinking about like each critical piece of what you're presenting to these scholarship committees and, uh, and you know, showcasing your true self. Anything right. else that anyone else wants no. to add to that? So the only thing I would add, I, I want to be uh, cognizant of time, but, but I did want to touch on briefly since we, um, for the film students, this is kind of an easy one. Um, follow the instructions, but also make sure the production values are there. The single worst thing you can do when it comes to submitting a, a film for a, a portfolio evaluation is have poor production values. If the lighting is bad, if the audio is not clear, if the editing is choppy. So again, simple things like that um, can really, really go, you know, go a long way there. So, but yeah, you can circle back to this slide and remind yourself that this is kind of what you what you want to follow. We have two more slides before we get to our to our Q and A that we'll talk about real quick. Um, this one here is mainly just to kind of give you an idea that different schools call programs different things. So as you look through these things, looks through these descriptions of these programs, you are going to see different uh, names for different types of majors in academic areas. So, and it's okay. In a lot of cases, they're they're teaching basically the same thing. One thing that's challenging and a little bit about this fine arts search process is, you know, this isn't like accounting or nursing, right? Those are pretty straightforward in terms of how those programs are going to be named at each school and what the content is going to be. But these, um, you should kind of look through these to kind of see exactly what a certain schools are calling things. And they may actually end up being the same and teach the same content in the same type of program. But again, just just a different name. And going back to what we said before, don't, don't be afraid to talk to each school about what you want and what they offer. Again, a simple email, a simple phone call. And again, it can be as like, this is my career goal. Here is what I want to do. Do you, you know, do you have that program or how would I get to that? How, you know, what would you call that program? So sometimes just as simple as that, starting out big picture, like, look, this is the end result. Do you have that program? What would it look like at, at your school? So I think you can, that can be very beneficial as uh, as you go along there. So um, I, the last slide um, is the one I talked about earlier in terms of, okay, how do I know if this is right for this? And Juliet's going to talk a little bit about some of these questions that you can ask yourself to decide, okay, do I want to take the plunge and really, really try this thing here? Thanks, Andrew. 
Um, yeah, so as many of you likely know, life in performing arts requires an incredible amount of commitment and dedication. Um, without the right passion for it, some students may want to seriously consider if it's the right path that's meant for them. So here are some of the questions that chairs of the department can pose to prospective applicants. Um, and there are also questions that students should be thinking through as you near the college application yourself. Um, some are, how dedicated are you to a practice routine? Can you take constructive criticism? How strong is your self-discipline? Um, what truly is your level of passion in your interest area? And another question I think is really important is how do you handle rejection as well? Ultimately, these questions can help expose prospective students to thoughts they may not have come to on their own. And life in performing arts is more than just, I like to perform and I'm good at it. It also, it also takes a large amount of commitment and it's certainly something for students to think about ahead of time. Um, if you truly think these questions and you're left feeling strong about your decision and your area of interest, then um, ultimately you can feel more confident that you're going in, in the right direction overall. Excellent. Dan or Brandon, anything you want to add to that or jump in? No, I think that I think she touched on it. It was great points there. Okay. Yeah. And um, the only thing I would point out is the do you understand storytelling and, and enjoy it? Just about everything the fine arts and communication arts do involves telling a story. Okay. So you really need to understand. I would say along those lines, you should probably like to read. I mean, again, so little things like that. But Ultimately, in just about everything in the arts, we're telling a story, okay? So as much as you think that that might not be important, it actually is important. So um, keep, that, keep that in mind as you, uh, as you go through that. So some FAQs, and then we're going get to your, get to your question, but we wanted to get to, to some of these frequently asked questions because we know um, a lot of schools are, are, or a lot of students are interested in these areas. How do I know if a school has a good program in the area am I interested in? And that's kind of a challenging one because when you talk to the colleges, they will tell you, you know, our, our program is great, our program is wonderful, and I'm sure it is in, the, in a lot of cases, but ultimately what we're looking for is the right match and the, and the right fit. But more to that point is, you know, does anybody have kind of these tips that you can give students? Okay, here are some kind of simple things you should look for as to whether or not a school is really good in this or they're just kind of maybe, uh, um, you know, uh, blowing a little smoke at you. So anybody wanna, anybody wanna uh, start with that? Um, I think I'll maybe start with, because uh, this doesn't necessarily evaluate how a school is like, if it's a good school or not, but maybe just how you're asking the questions. Um, so don't ask like, is your theater program good? Is your music program good? Because like uh, Andrew said, we're going to say yes. Like we are paid to say great things about our schools. And I like, I firmly believe that our programs are great. Um, but I think the ways that you can be asking those questions are going to just be more open-ended of, um, kind of thinking about, well, what sort of answers am I looking for that's going to give me the confidence in it? So if you're looking for a school that has notable alumni in their theater program, uh, you could ask, how many of your theater alumni are, are currently working on Broadway or currently working in film or um, what are, like, are there any notable names that I might know? Um, but if you're looking for more of like, you know, diff kind of different kind of involvement pieces, um, what how many of your students are uh, theater majors as, compo as compared to not theater majors, but still able to be involved. You know, that kind of the, the ways of phrasing the questions rather than just asking like yes or no answers. I would also just touch and say a great question to ask is about student workload. You know, how heavy is the load? What is the requirement to these courses? Um, you know, how many hours in class? How many hours of work out of class am I going to be doing? So you get a realistic expectation of work. There's a lot of students say, oh, I'm going to go to art school. I'm going to get to draw all day. But there's a lot, there's a lot to those things. Um, so you want to make sure that you're finding out whether this workload is enough or whether it's challenging or whether it's too much for you and really gauge that. And another way to do it is talk to some of the students. The school can give you alumni contacts or give you current student contacts that have agreed to talk to you. They love to tell you about their day and the school and the projects they're doing. So I would definitely suggest asking um, either current students or if you can get in touch with faculty too, do that. They're a great resource. And finally, I would add to that too. Um, don't forget about the people that are right around you. Ask your teachers. Your teachers went to college somewhere. Where did they go? Did they like it? Do they think you would like it? Ask your, your private music teacher and ask somebody who teaches in the dance studio. Um, so good old word of mouth is sometimes the best way to find out about a, a school. So don't, don't forget those, uh, those contacts that are, that are right there. So is it possible to do a double major with an arts program at something else? 
The short answer to that question is yes. And what, I'm, what I mean by that is, I mean, there's no law against double majoring, okay? I, I think if you stayed at a school seven years, eight years, and got three majors, um, as long as you kept paying them, they, they probably would let you do it. But there are some schools that are definitely more, um, they're probably that, that are definitely more kind of um, encouraging about this to do this and some who are not. So what you're going to find is, yes, you can do it, but it, it really is going to vary. Even for, even the four of us on these schools, like our theater program at Webster, we really don't, I wouldn't say we don't discourage double majoring, but it's pretty hard because we beat you over the head with theater for four years pretty good. And and theater takes priority over everything. So if you want to try and shoehorn in a double major and a minor, more power to you. But theater is going to take priority over everything. On the other hand, there might be some other schools that kind of embrace it and make it easier. So um, panelists, do you want to do you want to address that or, or talk about what it's like at your school? Yeah, I'll go ahead and start with at Chapman at least. It, the ability to double major certainly depends, kind of as Andrew was pointing on, on a variety of different factors and and credit size is, is one of those main factors as well. We've talked about the different types of degrees that students can earn, the BAs or the BFAs, and that's really um, you know where that major difference comes into play. The larger or the more credit intensive a program is, the more difficult it's going to be for a student to to obtain double majors within that four year time span. And I would say at Savannah College of Art and Design, the you are definitely able to double major. We just recommend that you come in and do it the first year first before you choose a second major, so that you can realize how heavy the load is and. Um, whether you're able to handle that and how you're doing in school before you come in and say, all right, my first term, I'm going to do two majors right now. And you get overloaded and you feel overwhelmed. So we want to make sure you're, you definitely can do that. We just want to make sure that you feel comfortable before you choose a second major. What should I be doing now in high school to prepare for success in a college arts program? Who wants to, who wants to tackle that one? I would just reiterate, um, if you're building a portfolio of some sort, get creating, get productive, do as much as you can. Uh, you know, a lot of times you hear things like, okay, every hundred drawings, I'm going to create something I like that I'm going to use for my portfolio. So the more material you have, the better off you are. Build that portfolio, build the material, whether it's uh, dance routines, whether it's uh, songs that you know, whether it's art or paintings that you're creating, create a lot and keep as much as you can because, as I said earlier, the ability to get rid of things is a lot easier than to have to create something now for the portfolio. And I would maybe add, um, start thinking about, or if you're, if you are challenging yourself with like, um, the ability to accept criticism, like really start looking for ways that you can have people, uh, like it was mentioned before, like review some of your work, um, review, you know, just kind of getting opinions, getting some different things from, from trusted sources. Um, because I think at the college level, you're going to be getting a lot more criticism and you're going to have to be able to take that both like graciously, but also like, how can I use that to improve? Um, so if it's something that you are maybe working on now, like continue to do that, um, to just create more opportunity for, um, that expansion later on. Can I just make one more point? I would say yeah. for every school, you're going to go to your GPA is important. So make sure you keep those grades up and work hard on that. Um, and then. Uh, also, if you're doing dual enrollment, IB or AP courses, those usually transfer in so long as you pass them. I believe it's a three or better with an AP. But dual enrollment is a great way to start getting those credits now. And you, those credits will transfer in so long as you pass. So if you have extra time and you guys are studying from home or your schools aren't going right now, signing up for dual enrollment or e-learning classes is a great advantage for you. Yeah, and Dan brought up the um, the AP art class. That, that's a really good opportunity that for at most schools, when you take uh, AP art, the goal there is to, is is that you're preparing uh, college portfolios. So that really is a good opportunity to, for that. And then the, the only other thing I would add to all this is do as many public performances as possible, whether it's music, whether it's community theater, whether it's involved in your high school theater, whether it's it's dance, do as many public performances as possible. You should be comfortable being in front of an audience. You should be comfortable sharing your artwork. You should be excited about sharing your, your artwork. And that even goes for art portfolios and theater tech portfolios and film portfolios, okay? You, you should wanna you know, figure out a way to share these with the neighbors or to share these with, with your, your parents' friends um, to, to go over these because you, you should get comfortable presenting your work 
and talking about your work. So that's something that you can uh, you can do uh, uh, now as well in high school to, to prepare. So um, that's it for our um, for our questions. I think Alex is going to jump in. He's been looking at the at the Q and A's that have been coming in, and and, and we want to get to some of those. Yes, absolutely. Um, and uh, before I begin, Andrew, would you mind just uh, heading over to the slide that provided all the information of each of our excellent panelists? Um, I know a lot of questions have, have been brought up about that in the chat about wanting to reach out to, to each of you specifically. Thank you so much. Um, and to begin, yep, once again, we've had a lot of questions come in. So I'm going to um, just give these questions more general meeting um, to the full panelists. You can all jump in if you'd like. If, if um, not, no, no issue there. So my first question here um, involves COVID-19. So any anticipation changes to your BFA slash BM application processes as a result of COVID-19? For example, in-person portfolio reviews becoming virtual? Anybody? Uh, I can touch on that um, quickly. Um, not about the portfolios, but more on just the situation unfolding. So um, we definitely have gone virtual for summer right now, and we're hoping to go back in fall, but because of the cancellations for SATs and ACTs, we've decided that summer 20 and fall 20, we're going to waive the SAT and ACT requirements. So that's one of the major changes for us. We did virtual, we did virtual portfolio reviews and virtual music auditions uh, a couple weeks ago. So um, yes, where there's a will, there's a way, and we will adapt depending on what the situation is, is I guess the short answer. Awesome. All right. Um, going on to the next question here. Given that the majority of forms are highly competitive, that a student should apply for. Oh, we lost you there, Dan. There was, or Alex, there was some lag. Can you, you try yes, to? Yes, absolutely. Let me rephrase my, uh, let me restate my question. Given that the majority of performing arts programs are highly competitive. What is your recommendation for schools that a student hearing? Okay, let me try that. Are you all able to hear me? We got, we got, now we got half of it that time. Yeah. Okay. okay, so let me rephrase that one more time. I apologize, uh, apparently I'm having some connection issues. Uh, given that the majority of performing arts programs are highly competitive, what is your recommendation to schools that a student should apply for? The, re the recommendation for school, you said that schools should apply for? What was the last part of that? Yeah, essentially, it should, should students aim for in terms of um, performing arts? What they should aim for? Yeah, I think he's asking about student names for competitive performing arts schools. How could you, how could you get into that, or what can you do to better your chances of getting accepted? I think. Oh, I, I see what you see. What you can do to, to okay, no, that's a that's a good good question there. Um, for the for the really competitive ones, um, you know what what I would do is, um, you know, reach out to faculty from that program. It's pretty easy these days to to find an email address to find the head of a. Of a, of a theater program or a film program. And um, what you want to do is you can ask them what they're looking for. And what you should put in the subject line is question from a prospective film student, question from a prospective theater student, perhaps question from a prospective dance student. That'll get their attention. And if they don't reply to that, well, then you can do that information, kind of what you want, and see if you want to keep that school on your list. But um, but they will oftentimes come back with kind of, this is what a successful audition or a successful portfolio review looks like for us. So I would, I would really try to, 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 to find, uh, you know, an email address for a department chair and, uh, and start with that. Um, and you'll find that helpful. I might also just touch on and say that uh, it may not be a huge help, but the more touches you have with either your advisor or the admission office for the school that you're interested in, they keep track of every interaction you ever have with us. So the more, if I go into your profile and I say, okay, this student is really interested, they've been reaching out quite a bit, they're working with their advisor, that definitely helps some weight on your application. So the more touches you get with the, the school, the better. Excellent. Um, just want to confirm, can you all hear me currently? Got you good now. 
Okay, all right. Um, now I do have just another question here um, regarding scholarships in terms of fine arts schools. You know, how do fine arts schools decide scholarships? Um, with so again, with so many applying students um, with similar interests and skills, uh, what are some of the deciding factors on on scholarships for these schools? Brandon, you want to take that since I think that's that's kind of what you do, isn't it? Yeah. So I would say, I mean, it. it ultimately it comes down to sort of the the info and the uh, materials that you're presenting and that's sort of that's a very vague answer but um, again kind of what I said before these are professionals in our like theater department in our music department uh, visual arts that have seen hundreds thousands of different uh, portfolios and um, audition pieces they really kind of know what to look for um, and they can recognize some of those like kind of like raw talent pieces. Maybe they want to build more of that into their department. Um, they can sort of hear when a student has, you know, done, um, you know, something that is, you know, sort of special to their talents and, and things like that. I, again, that's a, maybe a little bit more vague in terms of like what they're looking for specifically, but um, because each like audition is a little bit subjective and we've had students who are very talented who come into our program, but they didn't get a scholarship because they had, you know, a, an illness that day during their audition. Their, their voice wasn't maybe quite um, what they were, what, what it is at its peak. Um, but I mean, your, your talents are not just like limited to how you do on that audition day. You're going to grow those throughout the four years or, um, you know, whatever kind of programs you're looking at. You're going to be able to hopefully grow and expand. That's the whole point of paying for an education in those media. Yeah, I mean, don't don't overthink it. I mean, bring to the audition what, what you do best. And because, you know, you, you can't game the system. I mean, generally speaking, you're not going to trick us into admitting you if, if, if the talent's not there. So don't overthink it. Bring, bring, bring what you have and then, you know, be yourself, be prepared, and then kind of let the chips fall where, where they may. Uh, don't overthink things. So I might just add one more point. If you link up with your admission advisor a lot of times that your admission advisor can give you feedback on auditions or portfolios before you turn in the official or before you officially do an audition. Uh, like I'm always happy to get students to send it to me first before they officially submit it. That way I can say, okay, this looks great. Let's go. Or, Hey, let's think about your order. Let's maybe change a few things before you turn it in. So that way you're getting not only the best of your work, but you're getting guidance from someone who has an inside scoop on the school and what they're looking for. Actually, I can add one thing oh. also. Um, the types of scholarships offered and the allocation processes from this, for those scholarships certainly varies from institution to institution. So that should be part of your research as you are going through the college search process to see what those scholarships are from school to school and the financial aid as well, because it's not like a blanket statement across all universities or colleges. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, uh, all of you, for for the response there. Um, we have time for just one more question here, and um, uh, a couple of other people have been asking um, follow-up questions involving the, the COVID situation. Um, what should I be doing in place of reforming from now until the end of the COVID crisis in order to fill the gap? So these are referring to, to students who, you know, aren't able to perform on stage currently. Um, you know, how can they replace that opportunity right now? You know, I mean, performing, yes, you should obviously keep performing, but I know that's hard after a while. Um, use this time to do those things you probably should be doing, but maybe didn't. And what I mean by that is now is a great time to research the life and times of, of, of a favorite um, uh, author or a, or a favorite um, actor that you did, or, you know, a favorite composer or a favorite dancer. So, you know, historical period and researching historical periods can be very beneficial. If you're doing a play or a production set, you know, in the 1930s, you should know about what was going on in the 1930s uh, at that time. So I would say use that time to kind of do that, what we might call ancillary research regarding a, a role or a piece of music or artwork. And, and also keep creating. I mean, create, if you're a performing artist, write a script, write a one man show and perform and tape it for yourself. You know, if you're an artist, as terrible as the situation is right now outside, this is a great time for creatives because you have time, you're inside, you know, put something to paper, create things while you're in this. And uh, as an artist, you can continue to create even if it's just you and if it's a solo thing. So use this time wisely that you have, I would say. All right. Um, well, that 
does conclude um, our presentation entitled Understanding Admissions at Fine and Performing Arts Colleges. Um, I want to give a big round of applause to our panelists. Uh, I'm sure everyone who was able to attend is also giving you all a, a nice virtual round of applause as well. Um, I want to thank you all for taking the time to, you know, present um, and, and give this good information for the students who, who are just looking uh, for college information. Um, just a friendly reminder to, to all who attended this session, uh, explore your college options in our virtual college fairs. We have hundreds of interactive virtual booths where you can watch videos, download materials, and even chat live with admission representatives from that institution. You also find that some booths have a schedule of their own live stream video presentations. So make sure you visit those today or another day if they're available. Um, that does conclude our presentation once again for today. A big round of applause to my entire panel. You all did an excellent job and uh, thank you for taking the time today to um, speak to all of our audience. So thank you again. Um, I hope everybody stays safe and healthy and uh, have a nice day. Thanks everybody. Thanks,